Hi everyone. In the previous lecture, we began with our discussion on the frequency response of cascode amplifiers. We showed that if a cascode amplifier is driving a resistive load, then we get the bandwidth advantage in comparison with a common source amplifier. We also discussed how historically when the engineers were building the first wide bandwidth amplifier, they chanced upon the cascode amplifier structure. We then discussed the other advantages that a cascode amplifiers offer, mainly isolation. We said that's one of the major advantages of a cascode amplifier. It can isolate the input and the output ports. We also analyzed a cascode amplifier with a capacitive load and we showed that we don't really get any advantage in terms of bandwidth. So a capacitive load, we assume the output node to be a pure capacitance, that the load resistance was infinity. And for simplifying the analysis, I assumed all the other device parasitics were negl negligible. They were neglected in the analysis. And from that, we showed that the cascode amplifiers in comparison with uh, a common source amplifier, the advantage it offers is high gain. So that is the reason why we go for cascode amplifiers, especially when we are driving purely capacitive loads. The goal is to get high gain, but the bandwidth reduces in comparison with a common source amplifier and we show that the gain into bandwidth product remains the same so we don't really gain much uh, in terms of bandwidth when we when, when we choose to go for a cascode amplifier now in this lecture i'm going to carry out a more rigorous analysis of a cascode amplifier taking into consideration all the device parasitics in fact, we will do the analysis both for resistive loads and a capacitive load and then see what is the real benefit that we are getting out of a cascode amplifier. Before we proceed with the analysis, I just want to quickly take you through computing poles for non-interacting nodes. What do I mean by that? For example, shown here is a RC circuit. It contains three capacitors, so at max it can have three poles. Now, if, if you see here, uh, how do we find the three poles? The answer to that question is it's not very simple here, especially in a system like this. We can roughly estimate what is the average time constant or an average delay for the system. And from that, we can roughly estimate the 3 dB bandwidth of the system using some approximations. You know, there are some procedures called open circuit time constants and all of that. We can do that. But we can't exactly write the location for the poles by looking at the circuit intuitively. So the reason is that, for example, if since there are three capacitors associated with these three nodes, if I dump some charge delta V onto this capacitor, then the, the discharge path is through this resistor, it's through this resistor R2 and C2 and then there is also other path through R3 and C3. So this makes all these nodes interacting. So when we have interacting nodes, it's difficult to estimate poles. A more simplified problem is something like this, which is shown here. I've inserted buffers here between these two points. So the buffers ensure that there is no current flow or charge flow from the capacitor into the, into the other resistor and capacitor networks. When we insert the buffer, then we can immediately see that if, if you dump some charge onto this capacitor or onto this capacitor delta V, the only path for the charge to flow through is through R2. And I'm assuming this impedance of this buffer is so low, so it's going to only flow through R2. So at each node, if we were to estimate the time constants, it's pretty simple. It's simply the capacitance at that node multiplied by the equivalent resistance seen by this capacitance. So that will be the path through which the capacitance will be discharged or charged. So in this case, in the first node, it's going to be, I'll call tau1 as the time constant, it's going to be R1C1. The second node is going to be tau2, which is R2C2. Again, the only discharge path is through the resistor. Our charging path is also through the resistor, as no current is drawn by the buffer here. In the same way, the third time constant here is given by R3C3. And the poles in this system is simply inverse of the time constant. So the pole here at this node, it's going to be 1 by R1C1. At the output node, at the second node, it's going to be 1 by R2C2. And here it's going to be 1 by R3C3. 
in fact we can readily verify the location of the poles by just deriving uh, the uh, writing kzls and kvls and deriving the expression for the transfer functions in the same way for the circuit shown here i have now shown here this this here is a transconductor a transconductor driving a parallel rc circuit so this is something that better approximates better approximate most of your mos circuits so a transconductor is just a current source it's generating a current proportional to the input source now this is going to flow through a parallel rc network and the input impedance of an ideal transconductor if you take an ideal transconductor it takes voltage as an input and generates current as an output now if i connect a voltage source with a finite source resistance an ideal transconductor we want all the voltage to appear across the input so therefore the input impedance for an ideal transconductor is infinity which means it should not draw any current similarly if you are connecting a load resistance to the transconductor you would ideally for an ideal transconductor you would want all the current to flow through the load resistor which means the output impedance of a transconductor is infinity so keeping that in mind if i dump some charge delta v across the capacitor c1 since input impedance is infinity output impedance is infinity the only path for discharging or charging is through r1 itself so r1 here mainly acts as a path for discharging the capacitor so the time constant associated with this node will be tau1 which is r1 into c1 so it's c1 multiplied the multiplied by the total equivalent resistance seen by that so you get the time constant same way i can argue for the in the second node as well the time constant is going to be r2 c2 and for the third node it's going to be r3 c3 and the respective poles at each of those nodes will be inverse of those time constants so now we are going to employ this procedure even in the more complicated or slightly complicated cascode and common source amplifiers and very quickly we are going to estimate the poles and transfer function poles and thus the transfer function for cascode and common source amplifiers so all we are saying here is that if you have non interacting nodes so the charging or discharging of capacitance at each node is uniquely determined by the equivalent resistance seen at that node then we can easily estimate the poles by finding the time constant at each node and just inverting it you get the pole locations from that so as an example i have shown a circuit here which is a common source amplifier with a capacitance c1 at the gate terminal and a capacitance cl at the output terminal so for the time being in the analysis i'm going to assume r not is infinity now if i assume that with this you can directly see that the current flowing into the gate terminal is zero so therefore if you dump some charge on this capacitance then the only path for discharge is through R rs or similarly the charging current if vs is if you apply a sudden step input at vs step voltage at vs then the charging path is only through rs so the time constant at this node here to charge this capacitance is rs into c1 similarly at the output node mosfet just serves as a current source of value gm times vg so this capacitor to charge or discharge this capacitor the path is mostly especially to discharge the capacitor the path is mainly through rl itself so the output node again the time constant is given by cl times rl so these two nodes are non interacting nodes so i can directly make that approximation and say tau2 is simply clrl so the two poles in this amplifier the first pole is at 1 by rs into c1 the second pole is at 1 by rl into cl the moment we introduce cc in the circuit these two nodes now become interactive so if i dump some charge delta v then we also tend to have a path through this capacitor cc to the output node so it becomes difficult to analyze and try to get some simple closed form expressions so in that case we resort to miller's theorem miller on miller's approximation and split this capacitance cc into two equivalent capacitances at input one at input and one at the output so in that case the total capacitance at the input i'm going to call them call it as c1 dash that's given by c1 plus cc into 1 plus gmr so this comes from the miller's approximation this directly follows from the miller's theorem similarly at the output node i'm going to call the total load capacitance as cl dash that will be cl plus cc into 1 plus 1 by gmr so now we have already analyzed the circuit like this now if you have a 
two non-interacting capacitors like this, we know to find the poles. The pole here, the first pole here at this node is 1 by Rs into C1 dash. The second pole will be 1 by RL into CL dash. So that's it about finding poles in MOS circuits. I've, especially after making Miller's approximation, the analysis becomes much simpler. So we are going to use this approximations and try and analyze a cascode amplifier. Shown here is a cascode amplifier. I have shown three explicit capacitors in the circuit. So one is C1, the other one is C int, and CL is the load capacitance at the output node. I'll very quickly take you through what are the device parasitic contributions to each of these capacitances. Now let's look at C1 here. C1 is the input capacitance, total capacitance represented at the input. C1 here captures all the capacitances at the input port. So if you, I'm just drawing this first transistor here. So let this be transistor 1 and this is transistor 2. So you will have CGS1 from this transistor and CGD1, we are going to Miller reflect it. Using Miller's approximation, we are going to add CGS, CGD1, the Miller reflected CGD1 to CGS1. So this will be your total capacitance C1 at the input port. So C1 here is CGS1, that's because of this first transistor, plus CGD1 times 1 plus the DC gain at this point. The DC gain of the first stage amplifier, if you see, in this analysis, I'm going to assume RL is a resistive load which is smaller than R0. Making the assumption and assuming that R0 is much greater than 1 by GM, I can see that the looking up the resistance is going to be approximately 1 by GM2 and looking down the resistance is going to be R0. So approximately I can approximate this total resistance to be 1 by GM2 and the DC gain of the first stage will be minus GM1 into 1 by GM2 which will be minus of GM1 by GM2. So that's what I've written here. The total Miller approximated capacitance of the input port will be CGS1 plus CGD1 into 1 plus GM1 by GM2. This is the gain of the first stage. If GM1 equals GM2, you get CGS1 plus 2 CGD1. Now coming to the intermediate node capacitance C int. Now to calculate the contributors for C int, we'll have to look at the second transistor and see what are the device parasitics that that can be included into C int. So, in, uh, sorry, in fact, both the second and the first transistors. So, first I'll look at the second transistor. You have CGS2 directly from source node to ground, and there is also CSB2 source to bulk capacitance from the MOS device, and there is CDB1 because of the first transistor. Plus, we are also going to add a capacitance due to Miller effect which will be CGD1 times 1 plus 1 by the gain, which will be GM1 by GM2. So that's what I've shown here. CGS2 plus CDB1 plus CSB2 plus CGD1 into 1 plus 1 by GM1 plus GM2, GM1 by GM2. So we can make an approximation. Uh, if GM1 equals GM2, we can assume this is 2 CGD2. So this will be your total capacitance at the intermediate node. Now finally, the third capacitance which is at the drain terminal here, to estimate that we can directly look at only the second transistor because at that node only the second transistor matters. So if you look at the second transistor, at the drain terminal you have gate to drain capacitance. Now since gate is at ground, the gate to drain capacitance will directly appear at the output. There will not be any Miller, uh, Miller effect at the output for the second transistor. So this will be CDB2. So the total capacitance will be CDB2 plus CGD2 plus I have added one component which is C load here. C load models the next stage load capacitance. Any external load capacitance which is not a part of the device parasitic. So now that we have written the three capacitors, all we need to do to find the poles is to find the equivalent resistance seen by the three capacitors. So then we will know the time constant at each node. Once you know the time constant at each node, you can just invert it to get the poles at each node. So for example, at the first node here, the total resistance seen by the capacitance C1 here is Rs. On this side, on the other side of the gate, it is infinity. 
So the total time constant it says is Rs into C1. So the pole will be 1 by Rs into C1. The second pole is going to be, if I are looking at this transistor, uh, at, the no at the intermediate node of the cascode amplifier, looking up the resistance is 1 by Gm, looking down the resistance is R01. So the total pole will be 1 by Gm2 in parallel with R01 times C int. Again, I can approximate Gm1 by Gm2 to be much smaller than R0, so I'll have Gm2 upon C int. At the output node, you have 1 by RL into Cl. So here the assumption is RL is much smaller than R0, so this approximation holds perfectly fine. So now keeping these in points in mind, we will try to show the Bode plot or the frequency response of a cascode amplifier. Since it's, it's a resistively loaded cascode amplifier, so the DC gain is GMRL, so this is 20 log of GMRL on a logarithmic on a Bode plot. I have made another assumption here. The first pole here is at RS into C1. So the source resistance is so large that that ends up dominating, that ends up being the dominant pole in the system. So if you have n poles, the pole which is of the lowest value will end up being the dominant pole. 1 by Rs into C1, here is your dominant pole. And the next pole, I'm, I'm writing it as omega P3 here as the next pole because 1 by RL and CL, so maybe the load capacitance can be higher there. And also because the second pole, if you see, it depends on 1 by Gm2. The intermediate resistance is very small and there is no Miller reflection at the second node. So we can assume that that pole, I have assumed that that pole to be at much higher frequency compared to the output pole. So that's why I have shown omega three, omega P3 first. Just, it's just an assumption we are making. Then using this, we'll try to compare this one with a common source. Now, when I'm going to compare this with a common source amplifier, again, since I've already discussed the parasitic capacitor contributions to C1 and Cl for a cascode, it's not much different for a common source amplifier. C1 is exactly this, C1, sorry, uh, the procedure is exactly the same, but the values can be quite different. C1 here, or rather I'll call it C1 dash here, is given by CGS1 of this of this MOS device plus CGD1 into 1 plus GMR. Now this is a huge factor. CGD is getting multiplied by a huge factor because of Miller effect because the gain between these two points is very high. Therefore, the C1 dash capacitance here will be much greater than what it was in a cascode amplifier. At the output node, the load capacitance is CDB1 plus CGD1 into 1 plus 1 by JMRL. Again, this I can, JMRL is much greater than 1, so I can neg neglect this term and approximate it to CDB1 plus CGD1. I can also add C load, which is the external load or the next stage load capacitance, which is, I'm going to assume both these amplifiers are driving the same load, so this term will be same. If you notice, the load capacitance is same, roughly the same for both. I'm going to assume both these MOSFETs are of similar dimensions. So CDB1 and CG, uh, C, uh, CDB2 and CGD2 of this MOSFET is same as CDB1 and CGD1 of this MOSFET. So CL is more or less the same, RL is also same. So second pole will be at the same location. The difference however comes in the first pole. This first pole here is much smaller because of a magnified capacitance. CGD gets multiplied by a huge factor and therefore and it appears as a huge capacitance of the input so your pole is shifted inward. So shown in yellow here is the frequency response of a common source amplifier. The first pole here occurs at 1 by Rs into C1 which is 1 by Rs into CGS1 plus CGD1 into 1 plus mod A which is the gain of the amplifier. And the second pole I have shown it here at for common source amplifier. Uh, uh, it's actually omega p2 or uh, let me call it omega p2 dash so it's omega p2 dash which will be 1 by RLCL again we made this assumption that RS is so large that that's dictating your dominant pole in the system now shown in red here is the frequency response of a cascode amplifier the first pole here occurs at omega p1 which is given by 1 by RS into CGS1 plus 2 CGD1. So this capacitance multiplication is much smaller. Therefore, we saw that the first pole had moved to a higher frequency. 
the second pole here occurs at the same point for both these amplifiers which is why I have shown at the same point for both these amplifiers so there is no change there additionally in a casco there is a third pole which is occurring at gm uh, it's occurring at gm2 upon c int so that i have modeled as a high frequency pole so here you can see clearly uh, i'm uh, i'm going to also make an assumption that this high frequency pole comes uh, after the unity gain bandwidth meaning the gain of both these amplifiers had gone had become less than 1 at this frequency in that case, what we are noticing here is that the cascode amplifier is clearly giving a bandwidth advantage. So it's clearly the gain is constant for a longer range of frequencies. So here if you see the gain is higher in this range, so definitely its frequency response is better. So for a fixed load or, or for a resistive load, a cascode amplifier clearly shows a frequency response benefit even if you include all the other device parasitics. Now I have not carried out the analysis for a bipolar junction transistor cascode previously. So that's why just for the sake of completeness I will very quickly discuss uh, the parasitic capacitors and the, the frequency response of a BJT cascode as well. It's exactly the same as a MOS cascode. The benefits are the same for resistive loads we are definitely going to see the benefits in a in a cascode amplifier uh, in a bjt cascode amplifier but i'll just quickly write write out all these uh, node capacitances and how to just find poles for a a, a cascode bjt cascode amplifier again i'm just going to compute the three capacitances c1 c int cl and I'll just find the poles by finding out 1 by C1 into the equivalent resistance seen by each of those capacitors. Now in case of C1, we'll have to first know the sources of capacitances in a BJT. I haven't explicitly spent time drawing out the small signal model of a BJT assuming that you would have already done it in a previous semester's course but to quickly refresh your memory, for a BJT, 3 terminal BJT, there will be 3 major capacitors. So these capacitors arrive from what I've shown here is a vertical BJT implementation. So the way in which we implement it is we start with a P substrate. This is in a CMOS process and we create an N well and a P well inside an N well and an N well inside that. So this will be heavily doped P N. So this forms emitter and this is the base and this here is a collector. Now if you see between collector and substrate there is a reverse biased P N junction diode and it is purposefully reverse biased because bulk is always connected at the lowest potential possible, substrate is connected at the lowest potential possible. So this parasitic diode which is formed between collector and substrate introduces a capacitance which we denote here as CCS. So this is collector to substrate capacitance, this is a reverse biased PN junction capacitance. And then we have a capacitance C pi between base and emitter which we called it as the diffusion capacitance. This is because of the forward bias PN junction. This is a forward bias junction capacitance. And then we have C mu, which is the reverse bias PN junction capacitance between base and collector regions. So these are the three major capacitors in a BJT model. Now we will see what part of these capacitors come in all the three capacitors and all the three capacitors which I have shown here in a cascode amplifier. Just to quickly, I forgot a point to mention. Here, this is called as a vertical BJT. We do this in pur purpose to get a wider, a better beta. Sometimes in a MOS technology, parasitic BJTs are naturally formed. So here shown is shown here is an NMOS, N-channel MOS transistor. Now, if you see here, this N plus this is, let, let's we call this as drain and source terminals. Naturally, the drain and source terminals form some kind of a parasitic BJT. NPN structure is automatically formed here. We can also show such structures in a, PNP, a PMOS transistor as well. The important point to notice here, this, this is called as a lateral BJT. Now this BJT, even though it comes naturally in a MOS device, the base region width will be so large that beta will be very small for this BJT. So generally, if you recall uh, a base, uh, a general BJT operation, you have NPN so the electrons are emitted from the emitter. These electrons undergo minimal recombination in the base region and quickly uh, 
go to the collector region where they are collected and if no recombination takes place in the base region then alpha the forward transfer ratio for current is 1 which means beta is infinity but if you have a very wide base region now these electrons will be minority carriers in a p world so this is a majority carrier world so the chances of them getting recombined, recombined is very high so a small fraction of the electrons will reach the collector most of them will get recombined and flow as a base current so therefore we will see beta getting reduced so that's why these are called vertical BJTs they are designed to have higher betas now coming back to the small signal model we will try to see what are the values of those capacitors which get included in these three values of those parasitic capacitors which are included in these three capacitors shown here so first i'll talk about c1 which is the capacitance lumped at the base terminal to the emitter terminal or base to ground at the input terminal so c1 comprises of if you look at the first transistor here it's c pi 1 c pi 1 because of the base emitter junction capacitance then we have c mu 1 getting multiplied by the Miller factor, uh, getting multiplied by the Miller factor here which is 1 plus gm1 by gm2. The gain remains more or less the same as it is for a cascode amplifier. So approximately I can say c pi 1 plus 2 c mu 1. This is the total input capacitance c1. Now to find the intermediate capacitance c int, you will have to compute the total capacitance at the, the collector node of this terminal here. So here you will get C pi 2 from the transistor above. Then we have C C S which is collected to substrate capacitance of transistor 1. And on top of that you will also have C mu 1, the Miller multiplied capacitance due to C mu 1. So remember this, this on the other side which is the output side, the multiplication factor will be 1 plus 1 by DC gain which is 1 by GM1 by GM2. So I have written it as gm2 by gm1. So the total capacitance you will see at the output will be cs1 plus if you assume gm1 is same as gm2, 2 c mu1 plus c pi2. This is the intermediate node capacitance. At the output node you have c mu2 which is because the base is at AC ground. So the capacitance c mu2 will directly appear at the load plus c cs2. The, the collector to substrate capacitance for the second transistor. I can also add a load in addition to that. So this models the non-parasitic capacitive load or the load of the next stage, load offered, capacitive load offered by the next stage. So this is your total load capacitance. From this knowledge, I can directly estimate the poles. There's, there is a small difference in estimating at least the input pole here is that if you see the input side, the input impedance of a BJT unlike a MOSFET is not infinity. If you assume beta is infinity then input impedance will be infinity but otherwise it is going to be R pi. So at the input port the circuit is going to reduce something like this. So you will have RS, R pi 1 and C1. So to find the pole at this node we can immediately find the total uh, equivalent resistance seen by C1. So that will be R pi 1 parallel RS into 1 by C1. So that will be your pole, first pole. For the second pole it will be 1 by C int into the total output resistance seen at the cascode node or, or the intermediate node here. Looking up we will see 1 by gm2 in parallel with r pi 2. So you will also get r pi because of the bjt. Looking down it is going to be ro1. So the total resistance will be r pi 2 parallel 1 by gm2 parallel ro1. That I can approximate to 1 by gm2 so you get gm2 upon C int third pole will be just 1 by CL into RL. Here the, again the assumption is RL is smaller than R0. So this is a very valid approximation. So you will see 1 by CL into RL. So that is the three poles for a BJT based CAS code and I have shown the Bode plot as well. This is purely for the sake of completeness. I have not discussed BJTs at all and I have not spoken about the parasitic capacitor contributions for different poles. So I thought I'll just discuss this for the sake of completeness. The plot looks very similar to what it is for a MOSFET. The only difference here is that I haven't shown it in this graph but at the input node the DC gain reduces by a factor of because of finite input impedance R pi 1 by R pi 1 plus RS. So you'll have to multiply GMRL with 
r pi 1 by r pi 1 plus r s that's the only difference if r pi 1 is very large you can it will be very similar to a mos uh, frequency uh, mos based cascode free, sorry mos based cascode frequency response now i'll assume a capacitive load so this is generally the case especially when we talk about integrated circuit low frequency cascode amplifiers cascode amplifiers find extensive application in differential amplifiers and operational amplifiers so we will talk about them in more detail at a, probably in a later course in a different course now there we will see that these cascode amplifiers are used as building blocks for high gain generation in those cases applications commonly we encounter a current source load so here i'm going to assume an ideal current source and just a load capacitance cl at the output node so this is a purely capacitive load same way i'm going to assume a capacitive load for a common source amplifier as well and we will try to find out what are the pole dc gain or what are the pole locations and also the dc gain for this first quickly for the common source since uh, the current source impedance is infinity i'm going to include r not in the analysis the dc gain is going to be minus of gm r not and immediately we can see the input capacitance c1 is going to be cgs1 plus cgd1 into 1 plus gm r not so instead of rl we'll get r not here and cl the load capacitance will be cdb1 plus cgd1 into 1 plus 1 by gm r not again gm r not is much greater than 1 i can ignore this term approximate the load capacitance to cdb1 plus cgd1 so then the pole locations i have already carried out this analysis for uh, the resistive load i'm going to repeat the results here so for omega p1 it's going to be 1 by rs into the total capacitance of the input which is c1 and omega p2 it's going to be 1 by r not into cl so that's what we have shown here we have two poles and here i'm going to make some small assumptions and show this plot here in the first case i'm going to assume 1 by r not cl is the dominant pole so since r not is a very large value i'm going to assume that and 1 by r s c1 is a non dominant pole and then we will analyze the other case as well where 1 by r s c1 happens to be the dominant pole and 1 by r not cl will be the non dominant pole but the profile will look roughly the same and the dc gain here is 20 log of mod gm on this is a bode plot its magnitude is gm or not we are now going to compare this frequency response to a capacitive load cascode amplifier frequency response i have already calculated the values of c int c l and c1 so those values will remain the same uh, sorry those values will undergo some minor modifications we will see what are those changes right now and that's what is going to give us very different frequency response here so first i'm going to estimate c1 for this amplifier here before i do that i should quickly refresh your memory on the input impedance of a common gate amplifier if the output drain node is open circuited then the input impedance of a common amp common gate amplifier if i apply a finite voltage the current drawn here will be zero because the output current here is zero so since this current is zero the input current will also be zero so which means the input impedance will be infinity here so this is something i just wanted to keep in mind when we are doing this analysis now keeping this in mind we will try to find out what is the voltage gain of the first stage the voltage gain of the first stage can be found by gm1 minus of gm1 which is a short circuit transconductance of the first stage multiplied by the output resistance seen at the first stage at this node now that output resistance is simply the resistance looking up into the source of the second transistor that we just saw because it's a capacitive load i can assume the low frequency resistance is going to be infinity and looking down it's r not 1 so it's going to be r out 1 is going to be r not 1 so the gain will be minus of gm1 r01 i'm going to assume that same as gm r not of a common source so it's going to be minus of gm r not so the miller reflected capacitance because of cgd1 here if you notice this it's very different than what it was for a capacitive for a resistive load it's much higher the input miller reflected capacitance capacitance is actually 
1 plus gm or not times cgd it's much higher than what it was in a cascode amplifier with resistive load if you recall it was just cgd 1 into 2 approximately here it's much higher and the other capacitances more or less remain the same c int because there is no miller reflectant miller uh, effect in the output load capacitance so i'm just adding uh, c small load which is the load capacitance not due to the parasitic capacitors and the intermediate capacitance the only difference here will be cgd1 into 1 plus 1 by gm or not if i neglect this term if you recall in the previous analysis on with resistive load this term was 2 cgd1 but now it's just going to be cgd1 itself so more or less i can assume that this term remains more or less the same but c1 has changed significantly compared to what it was for the resistive loaded cascode it has increased significantly so keeping this in mind now we will write the pole expressions which is 1 by rsc1 for the second pole here interestingly if you see here the second pole here is no longer gm2 by c int that's because in case of a resistively i mean a capacitively loaded cascode the equivalent capacitance seen resistance seen by this capacitance c int will be looking up its infinity looking down it is r not so therefore it will be 1 by r not into c int the third pole will be again this will also be very different for a resistive i mean for a capacitively loaded uh, cascode amplifier here for the third pole you will have to find the resistance looking into the drain of the second cascode the second mos device and that is nothing but the cascode output impedance which will be gm2 ro2 multiplied by ro1 or i can approximate it to gm r not square which is a very huge value so the load capacitance gets multiplied by 1 by r out into cl now keeping this in mind so we have now three poles in the system all the locations of all the three poles are way different than what it was for a resistively loaded cascode amplifier for a resistively loaded cascode amplifier the first pole if i ignore i'll just write some approximate expressions if i ignore cgs1 it will be 1 by rs into cgd1 into 1 plus gm or not compare it with a common source it was 1 by rs into cgd1 into 2 now look at the second pole it was gm2 or gm upon c int now it is 1 by r not into c int so here it is i i will probably write this write it this way so gm upon gm r not into c int so in case of a common uh, a cascode amplifier with resistive load this was just gm by c int but now it has reduced by a factor of 1 by gm or not by a factor of gm or not which is a huge reduction and in the third case the pole was 1 by rlcl now i have assumed rl is smaller than r not so but now it has become much lower because your r out is much larger than rl r out is gm r not square so keeping these three points in mind we we'll, we are seeing that all the poles have significantly moved inward they have become much lower if you see this pole has reduced by a factor of gm r not okay so it is gm r not by 2 compared with a conventional cascode this pole has also reduced by a factor of gm r not and this pole has reduced by a factor of gm r not square upon rl of course it depends on the value of rl if you assume rl is less than r not then of course this pole has moved by a factor greater than gm r not if you assume rl is slightly less than r not then this term the ratio will be greater than gm r not which means the all the poles all the poles in a cascode amplifier with capacitive load has moved by a factor by a huge factor which is given by gm r not the first pole has moved by gm r not by 2 but approximately they've all moved by a huge value but one interesting thing to note here is that the dc gain here is gm r not square i'm writing only the magnitude it's minus gm r not square but the magnitude is gm r not square 
which has increased considerably it has actually increased by the same factor this pole has moved inward it has increased by a factor greater than gm or not so if i am assuming rl to be less than gm or not uh, rl to be less than or not then your gain actually has increased by a factor greater than gm or not so it has increased by a factor gm or not the whole square divided by gm rl so this will be greater than gm or not if rl is less than or not gain has increased but all the poles have moved inward so that's what i have shown in this graph so in this graph i have assumed that 1 by cl r out is the dominant pole 1 by cl r out is the dominant pole so even for a common source amplifier i have assumed i have showed this case i am assuming 1 by r not cl comes first and rs1 comes later now look at this this pole 1 by rs into c1 is roughly the same as it is now it's it's roughly the same here as well i mean it's exactly c1 and c1 is same in case of a cascode low, in case of a cascode amplifier as well it is the same the value is exactly the same so here i was making comparisons with respect to the old cascode with a resistive load but if you compare it with a common source amplifier a common source amplifier the input pole was supposed to move that's what we were thinking in a, i mean that's what we saw in a resistively loaded cascode amplifier but that's not moving it stay put where it was so for a common source amplifier which i have shown it in red here this is dc gain is gm or not the first pole i have shown it here occurs at 1 by cl or not the second pole occurs at 1 by rs into c1 where c1 here is cgs1 plus cgd1 into 1 plus gm or not now for a cascode amplifier here the dc gain here is gm or not the whole square which is gm or not times larger but the first pole first pole occurs at 1 by cl into gm r not square it has reduced by a factor of gm r not so you can see that the bandwidth 3db bandwidth or if you are going to compare the first pole it has reduced by a factor of cl into gm r not square now the second pole on the other hand the second pole on the other hand remains the same for both both the common source and this is, i mean the value is 1 by rs into c1 since c1 is same for both common source and cascode with capacitive load they both are going to follow the same path as 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 i've shown it in the red here they will follow the same path and then there is a third pole which is 1 by r not into c int additionally in a cascode amplifier so the gain will start rolling off with a slope of minus 60 decibels per decade later i'm going to ignore the third pole for comparison so i'm going to ignore this pole and look at only these two poles here and if you see both these poles here of course the gain has increased but bandwidth has decreased so the bandwidth if you see after this frequency both these look the same the response looks the same okay after this frequency after this frequency here the frequency response look the same in this range cascode amplifier has higher gain the reason is the reason mainly is because of its higher dc gain not its bandwidth the bandwidth has reduced but dc gain has increased so if i just look at it as a single pole system then the product of gain into bandwidth is the same so here if you see the gain is lesser but it's constant for a larger range of frequencies the gain here is higher but it's constant for a smaller range of frequencies so therefore the gain into bandwidth product the dc gain times the range of frequencies which for which it is constant is the same approximately same for both these amplifiers so you are not really gaining any bandwidth advantage when you, if you have a purely capacitive load the main reason why we go for it is simply the high dc gain a cascode amplifier offers you a very high dc gain that's the reason why we go for it of course the other benefits of isolation everything that still stand they still stand but bandwidth can no longer be made as a claim for resistive load definitely bandwidth is the major claim but not for a capacitive load i'm going to show for the second case the second case being rs c1 is the dominant pole it's going to occur even before 1 by cl r out 
So that's the assumption I'm going to make. Okay. So uh, in fact, I have ignored uh, 1 by CL R out. I'm going to assume your load capacitance is so small that I'm going to ignore the load capacitance altogether and consider only 1 by RSC1. So it's a cascode amplifier. So the comparison is between a cascode amplifier and a common source amplifier with an ideal current source load with no load capacitance. Load capacitance is so small that we are neglecting the load capacitance altogether. So in that case, I can ignore this pole, 1 by CL R out and 1 by CL R naught in both common source and cascode, I can ignore them. Then the only remaining pole in that case is 1 by RS into C1. Now for a cascode amplifier shown in red here, the DC gain is GM R naught square, GM R naught the whole square. Shown in yellow here is the gain for, uh, shown in yellow here is the DC gain of a common source amplifier. Both of them, the first pole is roughly the same, 1 by RS7, we just discussed. That value is same for both cascode and common source if they are driving, if they are ideally driving a current source load, purely ideal current source load, then that look value is exactly the same. So you can see both of them start rolling off at the same point. So here you can see a clear cut advantage. The bandwidth is remaining the same. When you compare common source with cascode, the bandwidth is remaining the same, but the DC gain has increased by G or not. So here, yes, we are seeing definitely a huge benefit. The gain into bandwidth product, the product of the DC gain times the bandwidth is definitely higher for a cascode amplifier. Bandwidth is same, but gain has increased. That's why you're getting the advantage in terms of gain bandwidth product. So here A0 is increasing for cascode, omega P is remaining the same. This is a very interesting result, though of course when we analyze it, it might all look very trivial, but it's a very interesting result. You should look at how engineers thought of solving this problem. The claim initially that, that, that was made initially was that cascode amplifiers offer higher bandwidth itself, not the DC gain. The advantage of cascode amplifiers when, when they were first invented was mainly in terms of bandwidth, not in terms of DC gain. But now, when I'm comparing a cascode amplifier driving a current source load, which is generally the case in low frequency amplifiers, what we are seeing here is that the input bandwidth, because of if you're going to drive it with a source resistance, the input bandwidth, the input pole remains the same for both common source and cascode. That's quite counterintuitive than what we studied for resistive loads. In resistive load, we clearly saw that the pole was increasing. It was moving off to a higher frequency. So that's what I've shown in the green curve here. Shown in the green curve, that should have been the ideal, that was the ideal cascoded, expected cascode response. Gain constant, but bandwidth extended by a huge factor. But here, what we actually see with the current source load is the increase in gain and bandwidth remains the same, but the product, the gain bandwidth product increases. So clearly we see an advantage here. But the moment you increase, generally the load capacitance will be quite high. And in that case, we can expect this kind of a response here. So there is not really much of a bandwidth advantage. The advantage in that case is mainly from a high DC gain. DC gain is the advantage you see in case of a cascode. That is the main reason why we go for cascodes. At a later stage, probably in the next semester course, we'll compare a cascode with a ca cascade of common source and common source and we'll see the frequency response advantages. But right now, this, this much of an understanding suffices. Okay, so with this, we have discussed rigorously the frequency response of cascode amplifiers with both capacitive current source resistive loads. And we saw what are the benefits that we are actually getting out of a cascode amplifier. To summarize, if for a purely resistive load, we are getting a bandwidth advantage in cascode amplifiers, we are, that's where the Miller, uh, the, the Miller effect is no longer seen in cascode because the capacitance gets multiplied by a small factor. That's the true benefit of a cascode amplifier for resistive loads. DC gain remains the same, but bandwidth extends. That's what I've shown in this graph here. Shown in green and yellow, that should be the comparison. But the moment you consider a capacitive load, we no longer see that benefit.
we see a very different benefit in case of the output pole being the dominant pole we see that the dc gain is the only benefit in fact the gain bandwidth product remains more or less the same and in case the input pole is the dominant pole meaning the input rs is much larger and our output capacitance is negligibly small cl is negligibly small then we interestingly we make a very interesting observation that both the dominant poles in common source and cas code are exactly the same they both are same which is given by 1 by rs into c1 we see exactly the same miller multiplication and that's quite counterintuitive to the initial claims or or the advantage that a cas code amplifier offers the main advantage is that there is no miller effect miller multiplication but we do see that if you load a cas code with a current source or if you load cas code with a purely capacitive load we do see the miller multiplication and the first pole will remain the same as it is for a common source but the advantage we get is the dc gain that's where the major advantage comes from cas code amplifiers with a current source load thank you